So with that, let us move on to the final readings for this module, and that is the Regensburg Address by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. As you read, or if you have read, you can ask yourself these questions. Discern, parse out uh, these basic aspects of the reading. Who is the author? Obviously, Pope Benedict XVI. Who is his audience? Now, this is an address that was given at the University of Regensburg in the fall of 2006. The Holy Father was not speaking in his papal capacity. He was indeed speaking as a, an intellectual, as a former professor at the university. We see this already in the title of his address, Faith, Reason, and the University. So Pope Benedict is reflecting on the role of faith, its harmony with reason, and the work and task of the university. In the subtitle, Memories and Reflections. So this is something that is very personal to Pope Benedict. It's not a papal address. It's not setting forth church teaching. It will be important to note um, this context and also to take note of who his audience is, therefore. His audience consists of the intellectuals of the university, fellow professors, students, those striving for knowledge. It's an academic address. That's the genre. It is not a papal address. This is important to note because of the reaction that Benedict will get following um, the address, and we'll get to that in a second. Also, ask yourself, what is the thesis? What is the main point that Benedict is trying to make? This is how you should be reading all of your assignments for this class and others. Be able to, after you complete a reading, go back and ask yourself, well, what was this all about? And in your own words, um, encapsulate what was the main argument. Okay, so what, what is his thesis? How does he argue this thesis? And then uh, how would you evaluate the reading itself? What are critiques that you would have or further questions that you would want to have pursued? Now, there is one quotation that Pope Benedict included in his address, which gave rise to very strong reactions, particularly amongst the Muslim community around the world. And the quotation I've put here in the second bullet point, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Now, this is a quotation that the Pope uh, has excerpted from scholarly works. And it was read out of context, or it was interpreted as his own position. Benedict, on the Wednesday following after um, September 12th of 2006, will express his great sorrow for the uprising that uh, happened as an aftermath to his address. And he says this, at this time, I wish also to add that I am deeply sorry for the reactions in some countries to a few passages of my address at the University of Regensburg which were considered offensive to the sensibility of Muslims. These, in fact, were a quotation from a medieval text, which do not in any way express my personal thought. We'll see him expressing this again um, in the footnotes, which he adds to the final later publications. But it's important to, to hear our authors, whatever we're reading, in their proper context and intention. And it was very sad that there was this uprising that is based on a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of the intentions of the Holy Father, what he is doing, and what message he is conveying. The results were uh, riots uh, in many parts of the world, and a uh, religious sister was killed, and many churches were burned. But let's get to why Pope Benedict quotes this. One of the essential quotations that constitute the first part of his address the heart of what he is wanting to present and to say to the world with this address is this, quote, not to act reasonably, not to act with logos, is contrary to the nature of God, end quote. Acting with reason, acting with logos, exemplifies something of the nature of God. In other words, our faith in God and our rational actions are intrinsically related. So con keeping in mind those five points, Let's move then to the readings themselves. Here we are at the main text of Pope Benedict's address. And in this file, I've highlighted some of the key points, providing you with my annotations. And we can start with Pope Benedict's own starting point of reflections. So we see him expressing his gratitude and his joy being at a place where he had exercised his faculties as an intellectual. And he says, it is a moving experience for me to be back again at the university and to be able once again to give a lecture at this podium. So he's relishing it. 
Um, and he really is a great intellectual, a great mind, a concise thinker, um, and highly cultured man. So he reflects on those years after a pleasant period at the Freisinger Fisch School. I began teaching at the University of Bonn. This was all the way back in 1959. And these were in the days of the old university made up of ordinary professors. He describes the lively interaction at the university. There were what were called dies academicus, in which you had professors from all the different disciplines coming together. Well, in Germany, uh, there are not separate private universities and public universities. Rather, every university, public universities, had both faculties of Protestant theologians and Catholic theologians. And they coexisted side by side, but not only coexisted, but they interacted. And this is what he's referring to. So this is the essence of the university. Uh, great minds coming together. It's a, a lively community of scholars. And that interaction, that engagement is what gives rise to advancement in human knowledge. So on these Dies Academicus, professors from every faculty appeared before the students of the entire university. And this made possible a genuine experience of universitas. So you see in the word university, what we call ourselves at the university, there's a unity of all the disciplines of, of knowledge. So he reflects on that, he relishes it, the specializations of the different disciplines made it difficult to communicate with each other. Many times um, what we find are departments are siloed, like the history gurus love talking to each other, the philosophies together, biologists together, and they don't really intermingle because our interests and our specializations are different. And even that be the case, everything makes up a whole. We make up a whole. We make up one university, working in everything on the basis of a single rationality with its various aspects in sharing responsibility for the right use of reason. Whatever the discipline is, at the university, everyone is employing reason and we must employ reason correctly, that right reason that we spoke of earlier, to do so with responsibility. This reality became a lived experience. The university was also very proud of its two theological faculties. I've explained that. It was clear that by inquiring about the reasonableness of faith, they too carried out a work which is necessarily part of the whole of the Universitas Scientiarium. So what happens in theology? It's this asking, this probing about the reasonableness of faith. Here's faith and here's reason. And we're probing the reasonableness of, of faith, this interaction of faith and reason. And in so doing, we're expressing the unity, the whole, the integrity of our learning. This profound sense of coherence within the universe of reason was not troubled even when it was once reported that a colleague had said there was something odd about our university. It had two faculties devoted to something that did not exist, God. Okay? So he, he's reflecting on the fact that a colleague, a professor, who intellectually, using his reason, made an observation and said, hmm, he didn't believe that God exists. And yet, look at this, our university. We have two entire faculties departments devoted to studying the idea of God, a uh, God for whom for him did not exist. Even though his faith said to him that God does not exist, it was still worth probing the question. That's the power of reason. That's the authentic use of reason. That even in the face of such radical skepticism, his atheism, it is still necessary and reasonable to raise the question of God through the use of reason. This is what happens at the university. This is what happens in the theology department. It's a rational probing of the mystery of faith. And to do so says that I am exercising my reason. To not do so, to deny doing so, says there's something missing. There's something deficient. And then he moves on to um, what he wants to begin to present on the topic of faith, reason, and the university. He says, I was reminded of all this recently when I read the edition of Professor Theodore Curry of part of the dialogue carried on perhaps in 1391 in the winter barracks near Ankara. So he is referring to the scholarly writings of a Professor Curie, a historian, and the professor is actually referring to a conversation that happened in uh, the Middle Ages in 1391, 14th century. And what's the context of this conversation? So it's in the winter barracks in Turkey, and it's a conversation between the erudite Byzantine emperor. So you have here a Christian emperor who is learned. So this is Manuel II Paleologus, and he is talking to an educated Persian. And the two of them are speaking on the subject of Christianity and Islam and the truth of both. So neither is attacking the other or denying either Christianity or Islam. They're recognizing the truth of both and they're entering into an uh, 
an intellectual discussion, an intellectual dialogue, the kind that you would find at the university. Okay? This is the work of the university to engage the intellect in this way. So it's a Byzantine emperor and an educated Persian having a smart conversation. And he recounts the conversation. Uh, Benedict is actually quoting the professor who has written about this. Okay? It was, was presumably the emperor himself who set down this dialogue during the siege of Constantinople between 1394 and 1402. The dialogue that is being quoted by the professor is written by the Byzantine emperor, the Christian emperor, uh, in the midst of the siege of Constantinople. And this would explain why his arguments are given in greater detail than those of the Persian interlocutor. So um, that explains why um, the Christian perspective is expounded more prominently. Notice what Benedict is doing. He's giving us a context for what he's quoting. He's not simply quoting this and saying, this is uh, the, the thesis that I'm putting forth. Rather, he's examining something, these ideas uh, that are being discussed, being written about by this professor. That's the work of academia. That's what it means to be a scholar. Okay. And so clearly this is a scholarly address that he's giving. He continues, the dialogue ranges widely over the structures of faith contained in the Bible and the Quran. So they talk about the faith. They talk about the image of God and of man while necessarily returning repeatedly to the relationship between the three laws or rules of life. So they talk about the whole span of what interests them, the Old Testament, New Testament, the Quran. And then he makes this mention, it is not my intention to discuss the, this question in the present lecture. Here, I would like to discuss only one point. So that was all background information for him bringing forth one point. And the point itself, he says, is rather marginal to the dialogue as a whole. But the point has to do with the issue of faith and reason. And that's the purpose. This is why he's making this quote. His point is not to expound the quote or endorse the quote. It's, he's using the quote to take a plunge into what he wants to say about faith and reason. And that's the latter half of the talk. And he says so explicitly. I, this is a quote I found interesting, and it can serve as a starting point for my reflections on this is issue. Benedict continues, and this is an important paragraph. So he says that in the seventh conversation, so remember this is a conversation between the uh, two intellectuals, a Christian and a Persian, and they have lengthy conversations. In the seventh conversation, recorded by the Byzantine emperor and here edited by this professor, and now quoted or referenced by the Pope, the emperor, emperor touches on the theme of the holy war. Okay, so here he's referring to the jihad of Islam. The emperor, emperor must have known that Surah 2, 256 reads that there is no compulsion in religion. So the Quran, the Surah 2, 256 of the Quran does teach that there is no, not to be any violence in religion. Now, according to some experts, so again, this is a scholarly exploration. According to some experts, this is probably one of the surahs of the early period when Muhammad was still powerless and under threat. So he's saying that and Muhammad did indeed teach this in early period. But naturally, continue, he continues, the emperor also knew the instructions developed later and recorded in the Quran concerning holy war. Without descending into details, he, meaning the Byzantine emperor, the Christian, addresses his interlocutor with a startling briskness. Now, this is Benedict commenting on the quality, the character of the conversation that he's quoting. So he recognizes that this is a briskness, a briskness that we find unacceptable. And it's on the topic of a central question about the relationship between religion and violence in general. Same. So the quotation is the uh, Christian emperor speaking. And he's, he's the one who says, Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread the sword, by the sword, the faith he preached. So the emperor is saying that Muhammad's teaching of, pre of peace, as he taught in his early period, that there is no compulsion in religion, is a, an authentic teaching, but it's not something new, it's not innovative. It was there already in the teachings of Jesus Christ. But if we look for something new, entirely innovative on the part of Muhammad, it would be the teaching of the jihad, this command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Now, Benedict acknowledges that the character of the comment here is not something that would be acceptable to the modern ear, to the, to the contemporary man. And indeed, what he was commenting on is exactly what happened. But the point is not that he himself holds to this position. He's quoting it to make a different point. And you have to be patient and hold on to your seats and, and follow his thought to get to his actual point. Okay. So let's continue. Let's do just that. 
The emperor, after having expressed himself so forcefully, goes on to explain in detail the reasons why spreading the faith through violence is something unreasonable. The emperor makes this statement, which sounds unacceptable to us, but he will go on to explain why spreading the faith through violence, that was the command to spread the faith through the sword. This, according to a Christian perspective, is unreasonable. Why? From the Christian perspective, violence is incompatible with the nature of God and the nature of the human soul. Okay? Violence is not compatible with who God is, nor is it compatible with the way the human soul functions. God, says the uh, Byzantine emperor, is not pleased by blood and not, not acting reasonably, soon logo, soon with logo, like logos, reason or word, not acting reasonably is contrary to God's nature. So the command to spread the faith, faith in God through violence, contradicts God's own nature. Because violence is appealing to power and force rather than appealing to reason. Okay? And this is what he says next. Faith, on the contrary, is born of the soul, not the body. We can force people, coerce people to act in a certain way, but that does not force their soul. And faith is not located in the body. You can do the sign of the cross, you can go and sit in a church, but maybe you're without any faith. Okay, so what we do, the movements, the motions of our body is supposed to flow from what is interior in the soul. But we can easily use our body in a way that falsifies the external and the internal. Faith is located not in our bodies, not in our bodily emotions, but it's located in the soul. Why? It's what we said earlier, that faith is a full, real, authentic human act. It's the submission of the intellect and the will given over to God. And the intellect and the will are powers of the soul to knowingly understand, grasp, give yourself over to faith, and to do so freely. Now, if I'm only saying, yes, I profess that uh, Jesus Christ is God, man, and I'm only professing that because I'm hungry and I'm, I'm starving and my children are starving and I, I want this food that is being offered to me, or my life is being threatened, or whatever other reason. But those are coercive forces that are not appealing to reason. They're appealing to the body. And faith does not reside in the body. Faith resides in the soul. So whoever would lead someone to faith needs the ability to speak well and to reason properly through, through the power of persuasion, through the power of appealing to the reason, introducing a God of reason, a God who is good, a God who is merciful and caring, and inviting the person to make an ascent of faith. So it's a free invitation. Whoever would lead someone to faith needs the ability to speak well and to reason properly without violence and threats. To convince a reasonable soul, one does not need a strong arm or weapons of any kind or any other means of threatening a person with death. And so summarizing what, what we've said or what uh, Pope Benedict is putting forth is that the Christian God and the Christian perspective, God is a God of reason. He is that God who has this word, this logos, and he speaks his word and things happen, let there be light. He creates through his word. It's an intelligible word. So God is a God of reason. In other words, reason is intrinsic to God's nature. When we act irrationally, we contradict God's nature. And violence is the epitome of irrational act because it's not appealing to reason, it's appealing to blunt force. Now we can act irrationally all the time um, in other ways that are, that are not as severe, uh, but nonetheless, they are irrational. So when a, uh, an adult has a temper tantrum, throws a fit, um, they're not acting rationally, right? Or when you know that uh, an assignment is due, but you just don't care, you're acting according to your lack of responsibility, not your reason directing your actions. Okay, so these are all irrational actions. But violence, appealing to violence, is um, intrinsically contrary to reason. Let's continue to the next paragraph, also a very important paragraph. Here he says, the decisive statement in this argument against violent conversion is this, not to act in accordance with reason is contrary to God's nature. Now the editor, the professor, Theodore Curry, observes, 
for the emperor as a Byzantine shaped by Greek philosophy. This statement is self-evident. Okay, so now he's saying that from the Christian perspective, because Christianity is undergirded by a strong Greek philosophical foundation, a foundation not based in faith or revelation because Greek philosophy predated Christianity, but it's based in reason, Christianity has this rational foundation. And therefore, this idea is kind of presupposed by the Byzantine emperor. It's obvious to him. On the other side of the table, for the Muslim Persian interlocutor, who is God? Now, the Persian is an intellectual, he has his intellectual foundations, but his worldview is distinct from the, the Greek Christian worldview. Who is God for Islam? Yes, indeed, God, the Islamic God is Allah. And who is Allah? Allah is not described as a God of reason. He is not described as a God incarnate, a babe in flesh, born of a woman. That's not the image of God. The prominent image of God for Islam is God is the absolute transcendent being. He is mystery. And so in Islam, when we come to God, we bow our heads, we touch our heads to the ground because God is absolute transcendent, he is absolute mystery. You don't probe the mystery of God because there's an infinite distance between this great creator, this almighty, omniscient, a transcendent being and temporal finite creation. So God is absolutely transcendent. And if he is transcendent, this is the, the, the way the, the argument or the flow of the reason goes, his will is not bound up in any of our categories, even that of rationality. So this transcendent God is not bound by the structures or the limits of reason. He surpasses reason. Here, Curie quotes a, a work of the noted French Islamist, R. Arnaldez, who points out that Ibn Hazm went so far as to state that God is not bound even by his own word. He's not bound by anything because he is far and infinitely transcendent. He is the ineffable God and nothing would oblige him to reveal the truth to us. Were it God's will, we would even have to practice idolatry because if he is the utter transcendent one, all powerful, all willing, he can will whatever he wants. This is in contrast to the Christian perspective of God, as we saw on the slide here, that God is a God of reason. Reason is intrinsic to the nature of God. Therefore, God cannot contradict himself. He cannot contradict the boundaries of reason. He cannot simply act arbitrarily apart from reason. Very different perspectives because of the different uh, worldviews. From here, Benedict goes on to say that we are faced with an unavoidable dilemma. And he asks this question. So this is the driving question. All of that was really introductory material. Now he's going to come to his point and he wants to address this question. Is the conviction that acting unreasonably contradicts God's nature merely a Greek idea? Okay, so is this Christian worldview or this Christian perspective of God, is this merely something that the Christians got from the Greeks, from Greek philosophy? Or is it always and intrinsically true? Is this the objective truth about God and about our world? And he says, I believe that here we can see the profound harmony between what is Greek in the best sense of the word. Okay, so Greek or Hellenism, the best of Hellenistic culture and philosophy. We can see the harmony of this Greek um, foundation and the biblical understanding of faith in God. These two do not contradict. Modifying the first verse of the book of Genesis, the first verse of the whole Bible, John began the prologue of his gospel with the words, in the beginning was the logos. Everything is focused on the logos. It starts out. Uh, the books of the Old Testament, it's the first book of the gospel, first words, referring to God's word, which creates the universe. And John also refashions this logos, which now is expressed to us, communicated to us intelligibly in the word now made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the very word used by the emperor, okay? that logos. God acts soon logo, with logos. Logos means both reason and word. It's the word that is spoken to express a reason which is creative and capable of self-communication. He gives himself in his word. He expresses his own being precisely as reason. John the spoke the final word on the biblical concept of God. And in this word, all of the often toilsome and tortuous threads of biblical faith find their culmination in synthesis. So in John's prologue, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh. That's the culmination and synthesis of the Christian faith. Now, the encounter between the biblical message and Greek thought did not happen by chance. This is what he wants to argue. 
there's an intrinsic value to the intersection of Hellenistic philosophy and Christian revelation. And we see this already, uh, an allusion to it, in the vision of St. Paul in Acts of the Apostles. Paul saw the roads to Asia barred. They were shut down. And in a dream, he saw a Macedonian man pleading with him, come over to Macedonia, to Greece, and, and help us. Give us this good news. Now, this vision, says Pope Benedict, can be interpreted as a distillation of the intrinsic necessity of a rapprochement between biblical faith and Greek inquiry. Rapprochement, the two coming together, the harmony between biblical faith and Greek thought. Why does Benedict ask this key question? And the key question again is, is the conviction that acting unreasonably contradicts God's nature merely a Greek idea? And if it is, it doesn't apply to those who do not embrace the Greek idea? Okay. Or is it universally intrinsically true? It's true for everyone. Now, he asks this question because there's a further implication. If reason is indeed universal, if it is to be found in all human beings, every, every creature with human nature, then reason could become the common ground for a dialogue, dialogue amongst the plurality of cultures today. In order for people to come together in dialogue, there must be some common ground. What is that common ground? If I profess faith in this God and you profess faith in a different God, that's not common ground. But if reason is universal, then that reason becomes the common ground and we can start working towards unity and harmony in, for the entire human race. 